Well, go ahead and give me a drum roll as we introduce the third color. Come on, somebody. The third color, do you guys know it? It's green. Yes, yes. It is a green Christmas. I've been trying to color coordinate with the different colors um, each week, and today I'm rocking my green No God sweatshirt. If you didn't pick one of these up, grab one at the merch store. It'll make for a perfect Christmas gift. Amen? Uh, but we did get some more sizes, and I know several were asking if we were going to make more of these, and so we did have more, although the 9 a.m. service might have just got a few already, so hopefully there's still some left for you, and we got some new colors like an orange and a tan and a one with hood on it, so uh, check that out at the merch store. Shout out. Uh, we're in a green Christmas. I want to talk to you about what this color means this season as we think through green Christmas. But before I do, maybe when I say green, there's some different ideas that come to mind, some different pictures that start popping in your head. Here's a couple things when I hear green Christmas that come into my mind. Come on. Let's go ahead and start right here. You're a mean one. Mr. Grinch, you're a... Y'all not even helping me out. Come on. Yep, all right, well, maybe you're thinking about this, Mr. Grinch. Maybe you feel kind of Mr. Grinch-like today. Well, we want to see Jesus jump into your Grinch heart and make it a few sizes bigger, amen? Uh, Maybe you are like me. You start to think about new Christmas Starbucks cups, and you feel like, you know what I'm saying, you got to go through that drive through and sit in the line. There's nothing worse then driving past a Starbucks that has a super long line, thinking that you'll go to a different one, and then that one has a longer line. That will work on your humility and patience. Um, maybe you're thinking about, you know, a little green Yoda. I feel like I see these little green Yodas everywhere. So shout out to green Yoda. Um, maybe you're thinking about trees, and you're like, you know what, I need a nice big green Christmas tree, and what's the purpose of green Christmas trees? cares all right anyways I don't know um but because there's something bigger than that right and we're going there um so maybe you're thinking about that maybe you're thinking about the mistletoe um quick lesson from the sermon today don't kiss somebody one that's not your spouse (laughs) under the mistletoe and two if they if they're not going to go to Christmas at walk with you no kisses under the mistletoe all right if they're open to going to Christmas at walk with you consider it all right Um, maybe you're thinking about green mistletoes, or maybe you're thinking about the green dollar signs that are flying out of your wallet into your online cart (laughs) at 99, and you're just, and and, and Amazon's so ruthless, amen? Just so evil with the one-click buy. It's just like, you just said, all right, maybe I'll get this, and it's already on its way to your house, and you're like, how did I do this again? We had a trash recycle day in our neighborhood yesterday. I show, sent a picture to some of my friends of like my recycle can was just loaded with boxes. It's like, man, how do we get this many in this year? Um, maybe, maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're in one of these graphics or you're just thinking about green. I got more money to spend. I got more stuff to buy. And green is a part of Christmas, you know? It is. I mean, it, 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 if it wasn't, Black Friday wouldn't be even a thing, right? But yet, every single year, we seem to set new Black Friday records in America. And every year, the statistic proves to be true that the majority of Americans live above their means. That we are experts at spending money we don't have. Come on, don't amen that, right? Don't elbow the person next to you. Don't be like, this is a message for you. I told you, I should, you should have came with me. This is a message for all of us. I want to preach a message to you today that I'm titling, uh, The Generosity of Christmas. The Generosity of Christmas. And I believe that there's something in this message that could be helpful for every individual in the room. Trust me. Hear me. I'm leaning in. Please, hear me. Try your best not to think that this is a message for somebody else. Try your best not to let the message glaze over you, but not into your heart. Take this message as is a message from heaven directly for you and ask yourself this question, how can I apply it in my life from the word of God today? So if you're ready, say ready. ready. If you're hungry, say let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. Father, as we get ready to eat from your word right now, we're hungry, we're excited. 
God, for this green Christmas moment, speak to us here today. We invite your presence. We invite your power. Holy Spirit, we're open to you. We're not closed. There's room in my heart for you. There's room in this, in this room for you. And Jesus, we invite you to teach us now from your word. Use me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When I think about this topic, the generosity of Christmas, and whenever there's a thought about money and finances when it comes to church, I'm well aware of the cliche saying, people get funny when it comes to money. I recognize that. I'm aware of it. One step further, that statement is true, especially in church. Can I get an amen? And what I'm burdened by is this looming thought in the back of my mind of the person who came here for the first time and they came to church and they heard a sermon about money. Let me just go ahead and say a couple things on the outset of this message that I hope would just be helpful, although I can't confirm and guarantee that it will be, but I hope it will be. Uh, number one, I had to do a little bit of research on this and think deeply on it. But friends, this is gonna be my eighth sermon in the history of our church over the past six years. How many Sundays are in a year? Come on, help me out. Y'all gotta do better than that. 52. Some of y'all said 55. Stop it. All right, 52. <laughs> I love you, whoever that was. Grace for you. Um, 50, 52 times six is a whole lot, all right? right? Eight of those I've devoted toward the biblical perspective on generosity and finances and money. It's not a whole lot. So I don't want you to say, man, every time I come to church, they always talking about money. Number one, that's not true. We just did 12 weeks in a level up series. We talked about knowing God, finding community, discovering purpose, making a difference, values, vision. We talked about a blue Christmas and how Jesus changes it. We talked about the red hot love of God. And now, 15 weeks later, we're bringing up this topic because I think it's helpful for us. Number two, let me go ahead and say this. I realized recently that this is a topic that I've purposely tried to avoid because I didn't want people to be offended. I purposely tried to stay away from talking about money because I knew that that could cause some conflict or some wrestling in people, and I just honestly didn't wanna go there. I wanted that to happen more organically, but I, but I noticed something, brothers and sisters, that if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll realize that King Jesus, who's a way better preacher than me, talked about money more than majority of the other topics in the Bible. In fact, finances is one of the top three things that Jesus talks about the most. So I realized I saw something in Jesus' preaching that I didn't see in mine. That if Jesus were to be sitting in this room, mind you, he is. He's here, God with us. He would be saying, yo, how come you're not preaching my word? Like, this is something that I talk about and you don't. And my primary job is to deliver his word, amen? So I realized that something that, that was off in my preaching ministry was I wasn't being faithful to the word to deliver topics that Jesus wanted us to talk about enough. I'm like, man, maybe a sermon a year. Jesus is like, I'm talking about this every other page. And so... With that said, I think that it's a good thing, amen? That's what I'm trying to just say on the outset is we don't talk about money a whole lot as far as devoting a sermon to it. Every week we have a generosity thought because we wanna encourage you that your giving is going through our church to make a difference in the nation, in our city, in the world, in our lives locally. But as far as preaching on the topic, this is one that we haven't done much of, but I'm encouraging you that it's a good thing to talk about. Yeah. Especially in Christmas, when we think about green, that God could have a word for you in this topic. So if you got all that, say, I got it. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Some of y'all are like, I don't know if I'm ready for this one, man. I'm not going to give you the ready. I'm going to sit here complimentary, but I don't know if I'm going to sexually say I'm ready. Maybe right now you're saying, yo, what's the point of all this? What's the point of talking about money? Let's look at the verse. All right. The point is this. Oh, I love that intro. It's a word for you. Amen point is this. I love this verse out of 2 Corinthians. The apostle Paul says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. 
And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace. Everybody say all grace. All grace grace abound to you. Tap the person next to you. Say to you. To you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, walk church, you may abound in every good work. Generosity is a good thing. Generosity is serving your purpose in life. It's, it's every good work is, is connected to this topic. And I want to talk about it here today for the next few minutes. And I pray that it would there be a grace on this message that you would receive something. What was so neat is somebody came up to me after the last sermon and just said, man, I've heard a lot of messages on money. This was the best one I heard because it was fueled with the gospel and I didn't feel a heavy pressure. I don't want that to be the case here today. I want you to be able to catch words from this sermon and be able to have some thinking, some wisdom in it. One of the other reasons, I, before I just unpack that, I wanna share this. I thought it was really neat. At the end of our Level Up series, I talked about our value of generous living. It was the third point in my sermon. I gave 10 minutes to the topic of generosity. Out of our entire Level Up series, I heard more feedback and people wanting to know more and excited and encouraged about generosity than any of the other topics. So I realized this is something that we should talk about more. Yeah. So here we are. We're in verse 6. The point is this. What's the point, Pastor Hyde? And get to it. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I call this in verse 6 the, the how for those who are taking notes. I want to talk about the how to have Christmas green this year, the how to have a generosity that's attached to your Christmas. I want you to look at this verse right here. In verse six, it says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Oftentimes, Jesus, and so does the apostle Paul here, he uses farming illustrations, agriculture illustrations to try to have metaphors that will help us think through biblical principles. In this case, he's using a farming illustration about sowing seeds. So I want you to picture a farmer. He's got a little pouch like this. Man, I should have loaded this up with little seeds. Our setup and teardown team would have been mad at me, right? And, and I want you to just picture somebody who's sowing sparingly. Let me give you a definition for sparingly. We'll put it up here on the screen. Sparingly, this adverb. It's in a restricted or infrequent manner in small quantities. To sow sparingly is to say, you know what? Ooh, I got a seed. I'm gonna put one right there. I got another seed. I'm gonna put one right here. Ooh, I got another seed. And now I'm gonna restrict that one. I'm gonna hold that one. Maybe I'll use that one next year. I got two seeds in the ground. I'm gonna do one right there. And now let me just watch what happens. He says it like this. If you sow seeds in small quantities, if you're restricted and infrequent in your manner of giving and sowing seeds, hear me. Just expect that to come back to you. Catch that? The point is this. Paul's trying to make a point. The point is if you sow sparingly, don't get upset with anybody except your own seed sowing. When you reap sparingly, it doesn't make sense in God's math to sow sparing seeds and have a big bountiful harvest. That God says, look, very, very similar to the farmer who just sows a couple seeds, he's only going to get a couple crops. But if you sow big, you'll reap big. Here's what he says. He says, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, maybe you're not familiar with this phrase, bountifully. Let me give you a definition for bountifully. This adjective here, generous in bestowing gifts or favors. Given or provided abundantly. The two words that I want you to see here when we think about bountifully is generous and abundant. Generous and abundant. What type of giver do I want to be? How do I want to give this year? How should we give this year? We should give generous. We should give abundant. Amen? That to me is like the farmer who says, oh, I got a lot of seed. I'm going to sow seed over here. I'm going to put a whole bunch of seed. I really believe in this thing right here. Let me sow a lot of seed right here because I want a big harvest. I want to reap a big 2022. The Bible tells me that if I sow sparingly, I reap sparingly. If I sow bountifully, if I'm generous in my bestowing, right, if, if, I'm, 
if I'm generous in it. That's what the NLT translation says of this verse, if we have it. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 in the NLT, it says, the person who sows generously will also reap generously. One translation says, the person who sows blessing reaps blessing. If today you're here and you're like, man, I feel like everybody else is blessed but me, ask yourself how your sowing has been. If you're like, you know what, I feel like I'm just struggling to just get by, ask yourself, how's my giving? One way to uh, not get yourself out of debt is not by not giving. Like the Bible is a little bit backwards in this type of thinking. The Bible says, hey, if you give, you'll receive. Now look, I'm not trying to sound prosperity gospel because the motivation behind your giving is really the main thing. If you're giving just to get, don't expect. Right? Like, like James, he says this. He says, some of you guys are arguing and fighting about giving and, and producing, but God knows your heart, and that's why you're not getting what you want because your motivation is selfish. But we're going to get to the why. But I just want to talk about the how. How I want to encourage you to give this year is I want to encourage you to give bountifully over sparingly. And maybe this is just some, some handlebars to think through. Walk church. I, 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 this, anytime I preach a sermon, I'm preaching it to myself first. That, man, how's my giving this year? Am I a very restricted seed sower? Like I'm counting every nickel and dime. That guy, you know what? This is for me. This is for me. Or am I being bountiful with my seed sowing? And I want to encourage you when it comes to the how, to be, about, to be a generous scoop. Come on, to, to tie back to that sermon. Uh, Pastor Mike was like, hey, Hayden, can we make a shirt that has a little hand doing a generous scoop for Walk Church? I want to wear that, right? Friend, we're a generous scoop church. We're going to lean generous. Generosity is not just giving. Generosity is the attitude in which you give. That not only am I, are you giving, but, man, I'm excited to give. I'm, I'm showing up passionate about giving. I'm bouncing in the room. Ready to give. You know, 2 Corinthians 9 is, is such an impactful verse. I should have grabbed this verse as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 talks about how the, the believers gave their self to the Lord. And because they gave their selves to the Lord, they could give their finances to the Lord. And I want to just challenge you with that for a second. You'll never be able to give of your, your wallet until you first give, gave of yourself. So you got to ask yourself, have I given myself to the Lord? Because once you're able to say, I've given myself to God. God, I am yours. You, it's no longer, you're no longer playing double dutch with God. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever play double dutch? Maybe it's just like one foot in, one foot out. You know, like I'm, I'm not sure if I should go in. Should I go in? Should I go in? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of half in with God. My wallet's on this half though. But like, I, I promise you I'm a believer. In fact, like, Here's a mask, right? I don't got anything else to give. I don't know. Everything else is over here. This is my side. This is my world. This is my side with the Lord. Friend, come on. Can I just say, move that 2022. Just get in the, just start jumping, amen? I want to encourage you to just start jumping. Go all the way in. Am I, I'm doing this. I'm giving. I'm going to group. I'm reading my Bible. This is so weird. I'm doing it. I promise you that that will be the best decision you can make is to go all in with God. To give yourself to the Lord and then let your money follow. When you can detach yourself from even your money and you can attach yourself to the vine of Christ, everything else will catch up. Or some things will just get cut off. Some things will just say, hey, you gotta stay back in 2021. I'm going forward. This is the, the how, amen? I feel you over there. It, it, this is getting me excited. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let's keep going from there. Verse 7, it says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Come on, can I just highlight this phrase, for God loves a cheerful giver. This, this phrase gets me excited. This word cheerful is actually the Greek word for humorous. It's the Greek word for laughter. 
It's the Greek word for an ecstatic laughter. God loves a cheer. Oh, man, I should have got this video. There's this one video. I remember seeing it. It's of a, a, a church in Africa. And when they came time to do the offering, this brother did a whole flip in a splits and got up and put his offering in the bin. He was so excited to give. I was like, wow. God loves a cheerful giver. You'll hear me say this often at Walk Church. This is about the why. The why behind you and your giving is so important. Y'all know God has x-ray vision, right? The Proverbs talks all about how God weighs the motive. God judges the heart. I know it's a cliche saying I was in a store yesterday and they had a bunch of shirts that said God judges the heart. I was like, I don't know if you want to wear that. You don't want God judging your heart. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Your heart is evil and deceitfully wicked. Like that phrase, only God can judge me, doesn't help you. Unless you know Jesus, who you can tag team in. Jesus, come, come pay my debt. Come pay my ransom. That's Christmas, amen? The ultimate form of generosity is God sending his son, the form of a baby to save us. The why is so important. The, uh, the, the, the motive behind your giving. So much so I can say today with confidence. Today, if you're going to give a gift, tomorrow, next week, whenever, you're going to give a gift to the Lord. You're going to start tithing. You're going to be obedient to the biblical principles. And you're going to say, I'm going to be a generous believer. It's a green Christmas. But if your why is not because I love Jesus and because I love this church and because I'm cheerful about it. Don't do it. Because th this verse, we'll put it back up on the screen here. This verse indicates that God feels some type of way about a cheerful giver. He feels another type of way about a non-cheerful giver. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, each one must give as he's decided in his heart. Don't give reluctantly. Do you hear it? Reluctant is to say, should I do it or should I not? Oh, I'm kind of reluctant. Anybody ever felt that way? I feel that way pretty much every week whenever a shoe drops. <laughs> I know I don't need it, but you know what I'm saying? Should I? Should I hit the buy now? Should I try to shoot my shot? I don't know. Right? God says don't do that with your giving. Decide that this 10% marker would be the first step toward generosity. Decide, just say, you know, I'm not going to be reluctant. Ah, should I do it or should I not? No, I'm just going to go for it. I, I was reflecting on a, a situation that happened to me this past summer. I was speaking at an FCA camp in Pennsylvania, sports ministry, and I had given away some of our, I brought some of our walk merch, and I, every night I would bless somebody with a piece of merch from our church to just bring some Las Vegas into the East Coast, and it was really cool, and I remember this, this, this gentleman, who random guy, I'd never met him in my life, I think he might have been an angel, because sometimes you know you might be around some angels and you might not know it, Hebrews chapter 13, and this gentleman comes up to me, he goes, hey man, I love the way that you're generous, you all, you're always giving something, I said, well, praise God, thank you, he says, I want to give you a word on generosity, I said, I'm open, give it to me. And he said, whenever God puts something in your heart to give, just do it. Don't, don't, don't argue the numbers with God or else you won't do it. And then he got up and left. And I'm still, I'm, I'm still wrestling with that word today. Because <laughs> I feel like the Lord will oftentimes show you something, give you a little nudge to do something. And then it's in that, well, God, you know, I also need to, well, you know, it's Christmas, you know, there's baby and you know like well I, I do tithe and and what I've been trying to just practice is in the moment discerning the voice of God and responding and what I've realized is when I do that friend I believe when you do that the Lord says okay I'm gonna trust you with more whoever sows sparingly reaps sparingly whoever sows bountifully seeds everywhere reaps bountifully blessings everywhere now, what I'm not saying is to not be wise. Especially if you're married, that means the two have become one. Amen? 
So a wise way to go about something is you feel something on your heart, God gave you a number, God, God put something in your heart to do, discuss that with your spouse and make sure you're in agreement, right? And talk through that together. What I'm not saying is just, hey, honey, I spent all of our money. Pastor Hyden gave me a word. He said, if you got a thought, go do it. I had a, this thought. It was a new motorcycle. I don't know, you know what I'm saying? It was, it, whatever, fill in the blank. I did it, right? Like, that is not what I mean, I mean, when you are in unity together with your spouse and God gives you something to do, do it. If you're single here, if God puts something on your heart to give, don't argue the numbers because it's likely that you'll go down. You rarely go up, amen? God loves a cheerful giver. One of the things the Grinch hated was all the giving. Just the... Why do they always gotta be so cheerful down there in Whoville, amen? Until he went down there and he got around it and he said, I'm feeling! And it was in that moment that his heart grew three sizes larger or whatever, right? And he then wanted to give. He wanted to be generous. There's something about the story in Zacchaeus' life where he was this little man in the tree, right? He came down and spent a day with Jesus, and then, and then the next thing you know, he said, man, I can't wait to give everything back. Everything that I've stolen, I'm gonna give four times the amount. Something about getting near Jesus just moves us to generosity, doesn't it? It's the why. Why are you so cheerful about this gift? Friend, this is not the moment to say, I'm so great. When you're giving, this is your moment to make God look good. There's something about giving. There's something about generosity that Jesus Christ gets the glory from. But if you're doing it reluctantly or under compulsion, can I just tell you what under compulsion means? Under compulsion means, man, I better give this or else I'm going to go to hell. Hear me. That is not what I'm saying. Hell is decided between you and Christ alone through faith in him alone. Eternity is in the balance of whether or not you get to know Jesus by faith and receive him as the Lord and the savior of your life. He paid all of his righteousness, right? Heaven went bankrupt for you so that Jesus would then take his riches, apply it to your spiritual bank account so now you could have eternity with heaven, in heaven without you even giving a dime, amen? Come on, the gospel is the main reason why we're cheerful. Don't you, please don't ever give under the compulsion as the, I have to do this to order to earn God's favor. You already have God's favor. In Christ, you are already a son. You are already a daughter. Well, how come you didn't give me this? The Lord said, well, you didn't even ask. I would have, right? God is so good. He's so big. It's not according to your finances that he blesses you. Right? So don't give under the compulsion as, man, I better do this or else God's going to throw a lightning bolt at me. No, that, that's not the gospel. Right? Don't give under compulsion. Here, here, don't give under the, man, if I don't do this, Pastor Hyden will be upset with me. No, I won't. Your giving is not for me. Your giving is for you. The more generous... The more generous you become, the more joy-filled you'll be. The more you start to make a difference in other people's lives. That's why Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know what the word blessed means? Happy. You'll be more happier the more you give. Wow. That's a radical thought. Even more than receiving. And everybody loves receiving. There's a little verse in the book of 1 Corinthians that talks about, hey, when I was a child, I thought like a child. Me, 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 me. But when I grew up, I put away my childish things. I started giving. But you know what's also interesting to even the paradox of that? It's one, it's one, one application to say, okay, when I was a child, I put away my childish ways, now I've grown. But then Jesus says the kingdom of God is given to those who think like a child. It's given to those who have the spirit of a child. You know what I've also noticed? Children give everything away. Like on one hand, they don't like to share, but on another hand, they're like, oh, this hundred? You can have it. <laughs> like, yo, Epab, you can't give your money just to everybody, all right? Like, 
that maybe there's an essence of ch- childlike faith too to our giving we need to have. Where we, we're not, I'm not really that impressed with this green dollar. This thing is not gonna own me. Dave Ramsey says that we better tell our money where it goes or it'll tell us where to go. You be the boss of your money. Nope, sorry. Let the Lord be the boss of your money. Once you invite the Lord to your financial process and say, God, what do you want to do with this? That's when you really start winning. That, that's the why. Let me move into the, the last part of this sermon and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Is everybody still with me? Yeah. You okay? All right, come on. We're learning together. We're getting better uh, together. So not under compulsion, not reluctantly, but I like this first part. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. And notice the Apostle Paul writing to the church he planted in Corinth. He's saying must. He, he's not saying each one should consider giving. Paul expected the believers to give. Paul had this expectation that, hey, if you're a believer in Christ, Christ is gonna give through you. You can't be around Jesus too long until he starts giving away, amen? He starts giving away blessing, money, healing, love. He gives words, he gives kindness. Jesus is a giver, amen? Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Now this is an interesting verse right here. And I wanna just lean into it for a second. I wanna bring some teaching and some biblical application to it as well. I wanna say this too, as a studier of God's word, um, as somebody who, my profession is to get this right. Right, I I, I never wanna share something from the Bible that is in error or is not true. Nobody likes a bad mailman, amen? Like, yo, get my mail to me on time and don't touch it, (laughs) right? I wanna talk to you, this last one, this is the what. I wanna talk to you about the what. From my understanding of the Bible, from from the left side of your book to the right side, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's this topic that has to do with tithing, all right? And I wanna just talk about this phrase, tithing, because I got a lot of questions the last time I talked about this, about what does the Bible actually say about tithing, and where is it, and what does it mean? So here's a couple things that I want you to consider that the Old Testament speaks of this idea of tithing, taking a 10% of what God has given you, your income, taking that 100% and then taking 10% of that income and then giving it back to the work of the Lord. That is an Old Testament law. You'll see that done in the priesthood, in the Mosaic law, in the Levitical law, that there was a law that was given, arguably it was even more than 10%, but at minimum there was a 10% mandate given that Believers in the Lord, in Yahweh, would take a 10%, the first fruit of what God has given them in their wealth, and then they would bring that to the storehouse of the Lord, Malachi chapter three, and that they would then give that back to God's house. Let me go ahead and say this right now. That for the New Testament Christian, for the believer in Jesus, the person who does not live by the law, but lives by grace, amen, we are no longer under a command mandate to tithe. As, as, a, as a New Testament believer in Christ, you, you can't find a New Testament verse that says, you must tithe. However, with that said, why we believe in tithing here at Walk Church and why we'll preach tithing and encourage people to tithe is not to try to submit yourself under the Old Testament law. That's already been handled at the cross, amen? Right, so we don't tithe to earn God's favor. The law has already been fulfilled through King Jesus. The reason why we preach tithe is because even before the law emerged, you'll find in the book of Genesis, before there was any type of Mosaic or Levitical law, you'll find Abraham choosing out of the generosity of his heart to take 10% of what God had given him and bless it back to the Lord. So even before there was ever a mandate, Abraham was doing out of generosity with King Melchizedek. Um, If you need a lesson on Melchizedek, Mike Bussey at walkchurch.com, all right? Okay, hit him up. I will not be taking King Melchizedek questions <laughs> um, unless you really want to talk about it. I love talking theology. So just playing. Um, that, I, no, I do. I do, actually. That was, the just playing was late. Sorry. The, the thing I was trying to say is that in the Old Testament, you do see tithing from the jump in Genesis, and then you see it mandated in the law, and then you see Jesus fulfill the law. But even Jesus 
right, has this moment in Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus is giving a sermon to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were considered the religious elite. The Pharisees were considered to be the Bible scholars. They would stay in one place for hours, reading the Torah line by line, rocking, memorizing the whole Old Testament. You can go to Israel right now in Jerusalem and find a bunch of them still there. And Jesus gives them a sermon. And he says, you guys are missing it. He says, you guys really are spending a lot of time on the word of God. You don't spend a lot of time applying it. What's so neat about Matthew 23 is the only edification Jesus gives to the Pharisees is around tithing. Like, let me show it to you on the screen. Matthew 23, verse 23. Jesus says, you guys tithe. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So is there an element where Jesus does encourage tithing? I find it in Matthew 23. Is it under the law that we're under? No. Right, because there's 613 laws, right? Like I'm probably break, breaking three of them just wearing this sweatshirt. My beard probably already disqualified me from the law, right? Like there's all types of 600 different laws. Like our bake sale is breaking a lot of laws right now. <laughs> Sorry, Ms. Rose. We're under grace. Come on, we're under the blood of Jesus. Like all of our law breaking all of our failures to tithe are under the blood of Jesus, right? Like, so I want to be clear on that. When it comes to what should you give, I don't want your tithing to have to be tied to, I have to do this, it's law. We don't live by the law. We live by the spirit of God in us and the grace of God covering us and Jesus Christ leading us and his Bible, the one that's instructing us. Come on, right? So, so that's the why we give cheerfully and that's the what. It, here's what I wanna say. I believe that tithing from the Old Testament to the New Testament is a very great first step into giving. If you're gonna say, okay, this generous thing, Pastor Hyden keeps hitting on this and the Holy Spirit keeps confirming it and I keep reading about the Bible and people are givers, where do I start? Everybody needs a start, amen, right? Here's where you start. Start with 10%. And the reason why I emphasize this is I put this verse back up on the screen. We're almost done. 2 Corinthians 9. The reason why I emphasize what God put in your heart, specifically this phrase right here, is because some of you have been making tithing a law, and you know that God's calling you to go above it. Don't allow tithing to be the lid. Hey, it's what I have to do. Some of you are thinking, 10%, that's it? <sighs> I was, I was thinking it was supposed to be more than that. What I'm saying is the New Testament requires 100%. The New Testament requires all of us to be given to the Lord and then let him decide. So God might say to you 20%. God might say to you 80%. What? Yeah, he might. That to me would not seem super out of the norm. It's whatever God puts in your heart, but he's gonna put something in your heart unless your heart's closed. I wanna ask you today to make room in your heart. Make room in your heart. Stuff in my heart, get out of the way. Inch it out, take it out, pull it out, and say, Lord, what do you wanna put in my heart for me to give? I've been reading this book recently. It's called The Treasure Principle. And Randy Alcorn writes this book about the heart. Because where your treasure is, your heart will be, amen? So you look inside a person's heart, you'll find what their treasure is. And he writes, I, I believe it's the best chapter on the topic of tithing that I've read in this book, The Treasure Principle. We're gonna have some for sale after the service here today. I wanna encourage you to pick one up. If you really want this one, come find me afterwards. I'm gonna give this one to you, all right? The Treasure Principle. And here's one of the things that he puts in this book, Randy Alcorn, he talks about it like this. He says, tithing isn't the ceiling of giving, it's the floor. Don't think that this tithing, okay, I gotta, I gotta aspire to 10%. That's, I made it. Friend, that's the floor. That's the, the starting block. It's not the finish line of giving. It's just the starting blocks. Tithes can be training wheels to launch us into the mindset, skills, and habits of grace giving. If God's given you a whole lot of seeds, friend, you should sow a whole lot of seeds. 
don't, don't make your own law and say, oh, it's gotta be only 10%. When God may be saying, I've given you a gift to give. Why do you think I keep giving to you? There's a proverb that says, the Lord is the maker of the rich and he's the maker of the poor. But the Lord is the maker of all, amen? So I wanna encourage you with just some of those principles, some of the, the mindfulness there, that if you were to start today, because we're going into a new year, aren't we? And we always make our resolutions, don't we? Maybe one resolution for you this year is to say, I'm gonna test God in the area of giving. In 2022, I'm gonna start tithing. Maybe you're somebody who says, I, I'm, I'm a 5% giver. Or I give a $20 crumbled up into the bin. What if you said, I'm gonna get serious about this. I'm gonna start with tithing. And if God has more in my heart, I'm gonna do it. I read a testimony of the 1800s richest man in the world. I don't know if you've ever heard of his name, John Rockefeller. Rockefeller was a great businessman and leader in the 1800s and Rockefeller was quoted before he died saying this. I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars. If I ever made it, I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 per week never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if he wouldn't have tithed his first salary of $1.50 of per week. I just want to encourage you, if you're, not, if you're not doing it now, you're not going to do it then. If God gives you a big load of money, you're not just going to start all of a sudden, oh, I'll do it. But if you have this rhythm in place where you started with $1.50, honoring the Lord. Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth. Amen the first fruits of everything he gave you. So I'm giving you this sermon to just help you think through this topic and prayerfully, it'll it'll give you the wisdom you need in making the best decisions financially, amen? Can I just share one more story and I promise you I'm stepping off. Can I give you one more? I'm I'm excited about this topic. One more story, I promise you I'm done. Uh, Nina pulled me aside this past week, my wife Nina. And I was surprised by this statement. She said, hey, so I feel like the Lord showed me something in my heart. And she doesn't say that too often, but when she does, I really try to lean in and listen, of course. And I said, oh, for real, what's that? She goes, well, I was just talking to Jesus and he put it on my heart that we need to give a offering to Walk Church by the end of this year over and above our tithing. Now, can I just be honest with you? First thought in my head was, for real? In my flesh, I'm like, hey, we've already, you know, we already are at the 11%-ish. Next 2022, we're trying to go to 12%. We're working on it. Why we got to give an end of the year, you know what I'm saying? And then I had to stop myself and I had to ask. I'm about to preach. She didn't even know I was preaching this sermon. And I said, when's the last time I asked what the Lord wants to put in my heart? What have, what have I decided in my heart to give? And then I realized, I wonder if some of you are like me. And maybe you've made it to the last week of the year and you haven't asked the Lord, is there anything you want to put in my heart to give? And that led me to doing this application. We're starting a new tradition this year, all right? If you're ready, say ready. I'm going to introduce you to a new tradition. We're going to call it our end of year heart offering. It's an end of your heart offering. Nina sparked it. Blame her. I'm just playing. I'm so glad that she was obedient to what the Lord put on her heart. And out of 2 Corinthians 9, 8, which I was already preaching, this idea that whatever the Lord has put, whatever you decided in your heart, don't let 10% handcuff you. And if it's not 10%, do what what God put in your heart. I just think 10% is the, the first stair. If you really want to jump into what God's called you to do, that's a good step. So next week, all right, next week, December 26th, the last Sunday of the year, I want to encourage you to bring your heart offering. Over and above your tithing, your tithing is what God's given you, your income. You're saying, okay, you know what? That 10% belongs to God. Boom. But I'm going to go over and above what God has put in my... If you say... 
God put $10 above in my heart. Can I just tell you God will honor that? And that 100% of this heart offering will go to fueling the mission and the vision of Walk Church. I told our staff recently, 2022 will be our biggest and best year of ministry yet. That we are gonna accomplish more in the next year than we ever have before. I said, you gotta buckle your seatbelts because we're going somewhere. And it's gonna require giving. It's gonna require giving of prayer, of, of time, of energy, of money, of love, of passion to see it happen because we wanna see the lost saved, amen? We wanna see the nations reached. And so next week, we're gonna take a heart offering. We're gonna have our own specific envelope outside of these worship envelopes, the heart offering envelope at end of the year. So I want you to get with your spouse or if you're single, just you and the Lord. And just say, Lord, what did, what, what did you put in my heart to trust you with and watch God do what only he can do in your life? Amen? Amen, let's pray. Lord, I just wanna thank you for this day. I wanna thank you for this sermon. And God, I know that this topic could be sticky. It could be touchy. But Lord, I pray that everybody here in the room today got something out of it, got something that they could apply, not in a way that's under compulsion, not in a way that is burdensome or pressured, not in a way that's reluctant, but God, make us cheerful givers. Come on, just pray that with me right now. Just say, Lord, make me a cheerful giver. And if you haven't received Jesus yet, he gave his life for you. God, I receive you into my life. Jesus, I receive you as my savior. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your power. I'll follow you all my days. And God, whatever you've placed in my heart to give, I pray I would do that for your glory, my joy, and the good of this church. In Jesus' name, amen.